Hello, and welcome to another edition of The Legal Zone, where we tackle injustice. John Salati, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Phillips. A pleasure to be back with you again. Dr. Cheney, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Good. We have a very special guest that I'm going to introduce in a minute. But first, let's talk about a topic. Consumer rights. Consumer rights is not an area of law that's specifically on the bar exam, not directly. It's somewhat like immigration law that these areas are not covered on the bar, but they might throw in something that would touch and concern consumer protection. What exactly are consumer protection laws? I'm sure you all have heard that, maybe not. But there are laws, laws out there that are designed to protect the customer, the consumer, anyone who is purchasing goods and services from someone, mainly companies. And these laws are in place to, as I said, to protect you, the purchaser. These laws supersede contract terms. So if you have a contract, but there is something within the contract that is harmful to the consumer that violates one of these laws that are put in place to protect you, then the drafter or the, the business owner, the merchant, can still be found liable for violating a consumer protection law. So what are some examples of consumer protection laws? Unfair or deceptive actions. Well, what exactly does that mean, an unfair or deceptive action? It's a statement or an omission of a statement by a company that's misleading. You read something, you hear something on the radio or on TV that coerces you to purchase, but it's not exactly the truth. Or they leave something out. This is a great car, but they don't tell you that it doesn't come with an engine. These are unfair or deceptive actions. Another example of a consumer protection law is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. This law says that businesses must accurately report information to the consumer reporting agency. Then there's something called the GBLA, the Graham Leach Bliley Act. And that requires all US financial institutions to explain in writing, how they handle your personal information, social security, your name, address. There's a lot more of these consumer protection laws. And we have an attorney today who's gonna help us, help explain to us some of these laws and how it impact us on an everyday basis. His name is Judson E. Crump. He is from Mobile, Alabama. And he is one of the special attorneys who specializes in consumer protection rights. He represents people in every sort of financial distress. Now that's the type of attorney that we all need. We all come up with some sort of financial distress in our lives. And Mr. Crump is there to help us. He fights fraudulent businesses who steal money from their customers. Can you imagine businesses stealing money from customers? They do it. He defends people from aggressive creditors, creditors who try to garnish your paycheck, garnish your bank account, whatever assets you have. He also helps people fix negative and false information on your credit reports. An all around helpful attorney. Mr. Crump is licensed in Alabama, in the state of Alabama and in Texas. Alabama won last night, I think they won big. So they if did. you're in any of those two states, we will share your information. We will share Mr. Judson's information at the end of the show. Welcome, welcome, Mr. Crump. Thank you, Salon. Um, How are you today? I'm good. I, uh, I feel better after that awesome intro you gave me. I'm <laughs> like ready, ready to go and uh, be somebody's hero in court now. But uh, it's Sunday, so yeah. go for it. Yeah. So tell us, what... What's consumer protection laws? Well, what, tell us something about it. Well, I mean, you, you summarize it pretty well, generally. Um, it, it is, it's a very big practice area. 
Okay, it covers a lots of you have to do with lots of federal and state laws, ranging from contract to common law fraud, conversion, things like that, up to more highly specialized stuff like um, you know the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Electronic Fund Transfers Act, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, things like that. So if you are a young lawyer or a law student who wants to do federal and state work and have to go to every courthouse in your district, then this is a this is a great one to get into. Um, but um, touching on the contract issue, <clears throat> I I like to consider myself not just like a um, you know, like a trial lawyer, but I also kind of, my clients tell you, they, they like, to, they'll, they don't like it. Maybe I don't know if they like it or not, but I'll harp on systemic injustice. All right. In our economy. And there's lots of things that contribute to that. You know, when you're in law school, you learn about the elements of a contract, you know, offer acceptance, consideration, capacity, legality. But we inherited this system, this ancient system from the days when people made the vast majority of their deals orally face to face with someone they knew in their community and only very important things were written down right um but we inherited that law and we kept it kept it going the four corners rule you know if generally if there's something written down that's it don't matter what was said you know whether someone lied to you here or there the four corners rule is still there in most states um subject to some regulations as you mentioned earlier but that creates, in today's economy, I mean, that creates a, a huge, huge systemic problem. I mean, because the vast majority of your business dealings are um, subject to contracts of adhesion written by corporate lawyers whose job it is to deprive customers of as many rights as they can, wow. you know, and, you know, they, they draft these documents and they're presented to you on a take it or leave it basis. It creates a phenomenon that I call the race to the bottom where, you know, one business, let's say you're dealing with cars, all right, and one business slips something in their contract that saves them $100 per customer per year, all right, spread out over thousands of customers, that's, you know, a lot of money for them. So then the business down the road does it and so on. And the only things you're left with, you know, and I'm using the car deal as an example, right, um, are what the law requires. The bare minimum that Congress or state legislatures have said, hey, you, there's a limit here. You've got to, you know, you got to have some warranty rights. You know, you got to tell people a few basic things about what they're buying. Um, but people aren't, designed to read fine print you mm -hmm. know humans evolved to detect lies when someone's lying to my face you can feel it you know um but you unless you're a very trained lawyer you have no idea what you're getting into most of the time and all of us unless you're living you know on some self-sufficient ranch in the woods like you're every day you're bound by probably dozens or even hundreds of contracts thousands of pages potentially right. you know that you, you don't read you don't know what you're getting into but you're stuck with it you know and it affects your daily life and i think it's a big problem how often do you see businesses taking advantage of consumers every day i mean i turn down more cases than i accept right. um not necessarily because they're bad cases factually there might be loss. There might be, you know, uh, something done wrong. But most cases I turn down is because the paperwork just protects the business so well. Mm. I mean, there's a million types of fraud. I mean, that, and new ones are invented every day. All right. So, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely a problem, particularly um, at the lower end of the social economic spectrum. A lot of people don't know what it's like to be poor. It's hard. 
I mean, if you don't have a bank account because your credit's bad, well, then you got to pay your bills in cash or money orders, you know, and you, you know, you, you got to somehow get your car payment sent, you know, now they have phone apps that you can do, but then even that can be difficult. You got to have a phone that works, you know, I mean, so yeah, it, it goes on, it goes on all the time. You just might not see it if you're living a comfortable uh, middle-class life. What are some what are some examples that you've seen of a situation where a company has taken advantage of uh, everyday Joe Blow um, consumer? Um, I mean, there's so many variations, but one of my I don't want to say favorite, but most uh, memorable, I guess, schemes that you run into is uh, a yo-yo sale, right? That's, if you're a customer with medium to poor credit and you need a car, you'll go in, go to the lot, they'll run your credit application. They'll say, hey, all right, you're approved. You know, we just need a thousand down and, and here's your car. They give you the keys, you drive off. Well, maybe because this person works multiple jobs or gets partially paid under the table or who knows what maybe the lending institution that was originally going to finance that deal decides you know we can't verify income we're not going to do we're not going to buy the contract and then the dealer's like well i can't get my lump sum from the finance company i don't i know i'm gonna take the car back and sell it to someone else and they'll just take the car back and not give them your down payment and it's called a yo-yo sale because you're yanking it back just like a yo-yo oh wow and they keep the down payment sometimes they do good dealerships won't um but a lot of these smaller independent dealerships that target low-income consumers absolutely they'll keep it they'll say something like uh well, you know, it needs a new radiator because of the way you were driving it. So that's $700 to fix. Uh, so we're going to keep your down payment. Or you had it for 10 days and our fee is $70 a day for rental. So boom, they'll come up with some. Wow. Um, they don't check the credit before they give them the car? They do check the credit. And... They get some kind of preliminary approval from some lending institution, but that approval as between the lender and the dealer is conditioned on a verification process. They got to make sure, you know, that the dealer's not sending them fake pay stubs or tax returns or whatever to prove income or residency or something like that. And so the finance company can uh can reject the contract within a certain period of time after it's been signed and do they let the consumer know that does the dealer yeah the, well sometimes they do sometimes they don't they they never do face to face but sometimes in the stack the volume in a stack of papers <clears throat> that the consumer signs when they buy the car there's a document in there called a conditional delivery agreement or a bailment agreement. And it'll say, you're taking this car subject to final approval by a third party lender. If we don't get that approval, you got to bring the car back. So they're technically on notice, but no one mentioned it to them at the dealership. Yeah. That's one type of fraud. I mean, I can, I can spend the whole episode talking about various types of fraud. I mean, they're, you know, we just recently had a case where, and I'll say who it's who it was against. I don't care. American Express, mm -hmm. and they was able to pull it out of court and put it into arbitration because they had this clause embedded yep. in, like you said, there's a big, you know, people sign these um, when they get a new credit card, they sign these documents, and in that document, there's a paragraph that says. You have 90 days or maybe even 30 days. Was it 30 days, John? When you first use the card to write in saying that 
you waive the mandate to arbitrate. And mm -hmm. if you don't send us a letter, then you forever waive your right to litigation. Yeah. Something and like American Express, they were one of the parties in one of the worst Supreme Court cases ever. I actually have it on my little outline I drew to talk about at some point. It's called American Express versus Italian Colors Restaurant. We yeah, can get into us, that, though. Yeah, well, tell us about it. What, what was on with that? Okay, well, it was actually not a consumer case. The Italian Colors Restaurant was a small independent restaurant, and they had American Express card processing, right? They had a card processing agreement with American Express so their customers could pay with their credit cards. Well, they were, American Express so was, was somehow overcharged on the merchants, right? Like, let's say the agreed, you know, fee for every swipe was $3 when they're really charging them three twenty-five dollars or something. I, I don't remember the exact facts on the money, but basically they were overcharging these merchants. And the merchants decided to file a class action lawsuit. All right. Cause it, the amount of the harm was insufficient to make any one lawyer take a case individually. Right. You know, it, it was pennies per transaction. So for a, a single small business, you know, a hundred a month, maybe something like that. So naturally class action is the proper remedy, right? That's what their rule 23 is all about. All right. I'm talking about law students I'm talking about rule 23, the federal rules of civil procedure. Just about every state has an analog. And it says that you can represent a class. All right. So they filed a class action. Well, apparently Amex had updated their card agreement to have a class action ban. All right. In the arbitration clause. Okay. Now you'd think like, wow, that just keeps me out of court. Like that surely that can't be enforceable. Right. Like that, that sounds unconscionable. That just deprives you of basically all remedies. Well, the Supreme Court, beginning in the 80s, decided that they just loved arbitration, all right? Um, and there's a whole timeline we can get into, if you want, about the Federal Arbitration Act and how it grew from a federal court procedural rule when it was passed in 1929 or something like that to something that you can slip into any contract in the country and be enforced. But the end result is American Express versus Italian Colors. And if the arbitration clause has a class action ban, then that just, there's no class actions. So you can, you can be a business that literally steals from small amounts of money from millions of customers and you have a get out of jail free card thanks to that arbitration agreement now for those who may not know what's arbitration how does it differ from litigation oh man all right <clears throat> so arbitration is one of those things that when you're in law school you're like wow that sounds like a really good idea you know um instead of going to court and doing discovery and having trials like why don't we just appoint some expert to, to hear the facts and decide the case, a private expert, right? So that's what it is. The court or the parties will agree to have some independent individual, usually a lawyer or a retired judge, but not necessarily, decide their case, all right? And in the old days, that was illegal, all right? In a lot of places, it's still illegal, technically. But because you can understand why, all right, in arbitration, there's no, they're not public. So you're not building a body of case law. There's no judicial review. The rules of evidence don't count. I was going to say, what's about the rule of evidence? Yeah, there's no rules of evidence. There's limited discovery. And basically, the arbitrator can do whatever they want. He's judge, jury, executioner. He's the appellate court and the trial court sitting in the same room. Wow. In the same brain. Okay. And it could, it, it can be, okay. I've done cases of arbitration. I've won arbitrations. I've lost arbitrations. I'm not always, I'm not one of these lawyers that's like, ah, you know, if it's arbitration, I'm not going to bring the case because we're going to lose. Some lawyers do that. I don't. Some cases are fine in arbitration. But because of the way the Supreme Court has in, interpreted 
the Federal Arbitration Act. And the Federal Arbitration Act, uh, it was passed in 1925. I've got it here in my notes. Okay, it was a federal court procedural rule that basically said if parties agree to arbitrate a dispute involving interstate commerce, then we'll enforce that. Okay, the concern then was federal courts don't need to be hearing, you know, every contract case between Joe Blow in Montana and Billy Bob in Iowa. So let's just allow these to be arbitrated when the parties agree to it. Now, back then, the Commerce Clause was a lot smaller than it is today. When Congress said Commerce Clause in 1925, they meant like people driving stuff across state lines. All right. Yeah. Today, the Commerce Clause means basically anything. All right. I mean, Amazon. Yeah. I mean, my my pen here, if it blew up in my face, that's that's this is an article of interstate commerce because it came from China or whatever. Right. So. So anyway, um, many states, including Alabama, have rules against arbitration because courts didn't like it because it's we're going to have this private justice system that the courts can't review. I mean, that just sounds crazy. Um, and, and in fact, in Alabama and in a lot of states, the anti-arbitration statute is still on the books. You cannot, well, up until the 1980s, you could not enforce an arbitration agreement unless the parties agreed after a lawsuit arose, all right? Which you would do if, let's say, it's a couple of businesses and there's a lawsuit that's going to involve trade secrets that you don't want on the public record. Great. Arbitration is great. You need is a private like resolution. Now? In Alabama, is it like that now? Well, the statute's still there, but it's not enforced because the Supreme Court in um, a case out of Alabama, I'm ashamed to say, called Allied Bruce Terminix versus Dobson, 1995 case. All right. It said, and this is where the whole nightmare begins, all right. It said basically that even where state law expressly prohibits mandatory mandatory pre-dispute arbitration <clears throat> federal law supremacy clause federal arbitration act overrides that all right and so basically anytime you had a contractual relationship with anyone it was subject to being arbitrated all right and of course the corporate lawyers are jumping up and down with glee like oh boy telling the corporate clients we're going to save so much money you know you're going to get away with whatever you want unless you just run a truck over somebody like this is great and it it was for them but of course there's a loser on the other side <laughs> here's an interesting fact though <clears throat> about terminix versus dobson nowadays we think of arbitration being something that you know conservatives are really excited about right because we think of them as being business friendly but back in 95 the only two dissenters were Scalia and Thomas because they thought it was an overreach of the Commerce Clause. <clears throat> they were concerned about, you know, federal government overreach into state traditional realms of state regulation, right? I happen to agree with them on that one. But, you know, I don't think back then anyone on the court could have predicted how arbitration would become so prevalent in every aspect of someone's economic life, you know, and you've had cases. Um, <clears throat> it's mostly a problem in employment and consumer context. The stereotypical nightmare case was there was a woman who got raped by her boss at work. So she filed a sexual harassment lawsuit and she had to go to arbitration. Come on. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how that's did, the kind of how, stuff. And how did that come about? Because it, you were saying that arbitration is something that the parties have to agree. But with our client against Amex, he didn't agree. He just didn't file a letter, send in a letter 30 days upon using the card way back in 2002 or mm -hmm. whenever he got it. So is, is it, it doesn't have to be a situation where they overtly agree and say i agree to arbitration they have to just fail to say they don't agree right well if that's what the agreement says because well credit cards are a little bit different because your use of the card if you use get a credit card 
and they'll send you the credit card and there's a whole bunch of documents with 80 pages of stuff. And you might not even review it. You might not sign it, but in most States, your use of the card, if you use the card for years, make payments. That's considered an acceptance of the whole. Of contract. everything else that's there, right? Of everything else that's there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now in an employment context, if you're working for a large corporation, you sign an employment agreement. That's also long and complex and impossible to understand. And so there's arbitration there. Then when your boss rapes you, you got to go to arbitration. You know, wow. I'm going to get Dr. Cheney in here because I know she's going to bring it down for our lay people. Dr. Cheney. Welcome, Attorney Trump. Crump? Crump. <laughs> did you just say Trump? She did. No. She did. I have never been raided by the FBI. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is probably a yes or no question. Answer to this question. Are we using the term fraud too broadly? That the meaning uh, is being distorted? Yes. Yes. I think so. I think that there's, I think it's one of those situations where the, uh, the lay person plain English meaning of the word fraud encompasses a lot more than the legal definition of fraud. You know, I think people have a tendency to think of kind of any sort of sketchy business or financial wrongdoing as fraud, but legally you get your pens out law students. Fraud is a misrepresentation of material fact acted upon by a plaintiff to his or her detriment. All right. Okay. So you got a false statement or an omission in the face of a duty to disclose a relevant fact that you rely upon and suffer harm as a result. That's fraud. So, okay. yeah. All right. Uh, you know, sometimes I think it's very difficult for people to determine fraud. So what triggers people to claim fraud? What happens? How do they know? You know something's well, wrong, but how do you know whether it's you know, ballooned to the degree that it's fraud? I think, I mean, I think that anybody that's lived in the modern world to adulthood has had some experience at some point where they, they've been snookered. They've been ripped off. They were mm -hmm. promised something that wasn't delivered. And I think that when people come to me, at least, it's when the conduct was so bad and unexpected or the amount of money at stake uh, is big enough. It's like, I got to call a lawyer. I got to find out what I can do about this. Yeah. You think people are reporting fraud more now than before? More yeah. different types of fraud? Now? I think so, because the Internet kind of mm. makes it easier you know you don't have to write a handwritten letter to your attorney general anymore you can pull out your phone submit a complaint to your state attorney general to the consumer financial protection bureau to the federal trade commission so yeah i think there's probably you can also post bad reviews on google and yelp and yahoo and whatever um so yeah i think there's probably more reporting but i also believe that for every fraud, incident of fraud that's reported, there's 10 that aren't. Okay. I had a quick question when you said that being expensive. Are these cases on contingency? Mostly, yes. In my practice, yes, most of my cases are on contingency. <clears throat> and what I try to do is find some sort of fee shifting statutory hook I can hang my hat on. All right. Like um, if it's uh, now Alabama has a terrible UDAP statute. Uh, UDAPs might be one of the few consumer rights questions you'll get on the law exam. Every state has a version of an unfair deceptive acts and practices law. It covers things like false advertising, um, pyramid schemes, that kind of there's random stuff like selling cigarettes without a stamp, you know, state by state it differs. But if you got a UDAP, 
violation or like an um, an odometer act violation or maybe a warranty then if there's a written warranty you have magnuson moss and so there's a a, a fee shifting provision in the statute <clears throat> and for those that don't know because i can see where you're about to ask me because for our law student audience fee shifting means the loser pays the winner's lawyer fees all right so let's take a fair credit reporting act case i love those um i love them because the defendants are banks and credit bureaus and they have tons of money and they they're not their feelings aren't hurt when they get sued it's just a math problem for them you know right um do we have liability if yes pay the guy but just to explain fee shifting there are certain laws right the american rule is that everybody pays their own attorney's fees unless a contractor statute says otherwise <clears throat> but there are some instances where congress has decided that there's a public interest at stake here that's m at least as important as the money and so we will incentivize good cases to be brought by making the loser pay the winner's lawyer fees examples of fair credit reporting act case um, where you might have something damaging on your credit report but the harm's kind of hard to prove because it's your reputation proving credit damage is difficult but if you can prove some kind of damages and get a verdict, then they got to pay your lawyer's fees and you submit a fee application at the end of the case at a reasonable hourly rate for the time and money you've spent on it. So it's basically an incentive for lawyers to bring legitimate cases that fall into that category of wrongdoing that Congress is trying to uh, address. Okay. So good. yeah, fee, when I have a fee suit the statute, I do contingency. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Cheney. Okay. I think you've already addressed the socioeconomical situation between the rich and the poor. And I had the rich may have attorneys on retainers, right? Mm -hmm. Does this group commit more fraud than the less fortunate? I don't think so. Okay. I think that, in my experience at least, there are exceptions, you know, like a few years ago when Wells Fargo had that policy where they were making all these fake accounts because they had built their employee incentive structure in such a way that they had to keep coming up with accounts to get a full paycheck or whatever. But things like that are pretty rare. And that's why they make the news. You know, most large corporations try to stay within the law, you know, um, they don't always succeed, but I find the more pernicious frauds are businesses that are aimed at poor people. Your uh, car dealerships that sell cars to people with subprime credit, small loan shops, payday lenders, um, things like that. Now, is, uh, there, ign is ignorance a defense? Like if someone wants to start a business, everyone can start a business. You know, you have brothers who want to start a business and they just, they're doing something. They don't know that the law says you can't take advantage of people in this way. They just think it's a good way to make money. But it turns out that they are actually violating a consumer protection rule law in a particular state. Can they say, well, we didn't know. Does intent have to, do you have to show intent with these? Uh, ignorance of the law is never a defense in a civil case for the most part. The, now in some statutes do require intent, like the federal odometer statute. It's called Motor Vehicle Information and Cost Savings Act. It has some requirements on title transfers, what you got to disclose in terms of a vehicle's mileage, things like that. It has intent to defraud as a element of a claim under the private right of action there. Most don't though. When it comes to intent as a practical matter, the consumer still has to have damages. You know, if, if, if there's no one's getting sued, or at least no one I know of is getting sued for, filing the wrong paperwork on accident, you know, or not checking a box somewhere. Like 
you know, no one's coming to a lawyer to put themselves through the trouble of litigating a case if they didn't lose any money or property or suffer any harm as a result. So, so no, it's not a defense. I mean, does it matter when you're asking for punitive damages? Yeah. You know, if someone's intentionally cheating people, yeah, that matters though. So it may be a good idea for all our business owners to make sure you have some sort of in-house counsel to make sure what you're doing is not violating any laws. Yeah. I mean, not, not, you don't even have to go as far as permanent in-house counsel. Just, I mean, call a lawyer that knows your field, sit down for a couple hours and say, Hey, this is what we've been doing. You see any problem with this? Right. He'll probably be like, yeah, you right. know. <laughs> All right, I just Dr. have one more. All right, go ahead. I just have one more. I Fire just have away. one more. Fire okay. Away. I am interested in knowing more about fraud on the court. Mm. When a material misrepresentation is made to tilt the wheels of justice mm -hmm. to the fraudster. Mm -hmm. Fairness is lost. And we hear this business, I'm a lay person, the blindfold is snatched off of Lady Justice's eyes. I haven't heard that one, but it's a good one. Okay. Yeah. That was mine, really. Some legal scholars are saying that this is what this is the most egregious act that can occur to our justice system. And I want you to answer why. And the other thing is, you have a video that's online and you talk about this woman, her car and fraud, and that you had to do a default judgment or something like that. You could share that with us. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Fraud on the court. <clears throat> um, kind of like fraud generally, I, this might be one of those things where the public perception of that phrase is probably different from the legal one. Uh, the legal phrase, it comes from the rules of civil procedure. I, the case you're talking about, it was, it was a lady had a default. She had a car that was repossessed and she got sued for like, I don't remember the numbers. It was a few years ago, but let's say she got sued for like 28 grand, the whole balance of the contract. When in fact the car had been repoed and sold at auction for like half that. So her balance was way lower, but in the affidavit filed with the court under oath and penalty of perjury, they didn't say that. They just said, yeah, this lady owes us 28 grand. Hmm. And I could prove that it was, that was just flat out wrong. It was right there in the paper. They didn't give her credit for anything. So fraud on the court in the rules of civil procedure, I think it's rule 60. <clears throat> Yeah, it says 60B or something like that. Yeah, it's one of the grounds for vacating a judgment. All right. You know, we have a policy in the courts. Judgment should be final. We're not going to relitigate stuff over and over. Even default judgments. All right. But a judgment can be vacated. There's certain time limits. All right. You have a time limit to appeal. You have a time limit to file a motion for a new trial or a motion to vacate. Um, but for fraud on the court, there either is no time limit or it's a pretty long one. No and no res judicata either. Yeah. So basically in that case, I had to file a motion and I had to tell the judge they lied to you. So mm -hmm. we need to, we need to yank that judgment back. Um, and yeah, I think fraud mm -hmm. on the court to touch did the it other. Work? It did work. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The judge was not happy to hear that someone had submitted a false affidavit. In fact, no judges like being lied to, all right? No, just like anyone else. They don't want to feel like a sucker. And when someone lies to them, they're going to punish them. So I guess as a larger issue, I do not have... Dr. Chen, you probably know more about the numbers than that. I don't know how prevalent fraud of the court is. I don't know what studies have been done. But it, it is a problem particularly in cases like collections where people that are getting sued don't have the money to hire a lawyer because they have the money to hire a lawyer. They have the money to pay the bill and not get sued. Um, 
And so a lot of stuff flies under the radar, unpunished. Does it, and, have to, does it have to result in a favorable outcome, meaning the fraud or the lie that was told to the judge? Can it be a harmless error? Or does, does the lie have to result in the judge ruling in the other side's favor? And so you bring it up. In other words, if in your particular case, if the lie was that it was 28,000, but she only paid 15 and they accepted 15, so it didn't really matter. Would that have still? Well, I think that even if she settled it after the judge was entered, there's a difference between a $28,000 judgment and a $15,000 judgment. You know, it has an impact on your credit report. It's on there for 10 years. So I think you still have an argument that there was real harm there. But as for the, the general proposition that does it result in something favorable? <clears throat> I don't know if that's a requirement of the rule, but as a practical matter, you know, if you come to the judge saying they lied in their affidavit, you know, it was really repossessed on December 1st. And they said December 2nd, like he's going to be like, why are you here? Right. You know, what are we doing? Um, that's that's how that probably play out. But kind of a no harm, no foul kind of thing. But I, I do think it goes on. I mean, in, in, in criminal cases, people lie on the witness stand. Defendants lie, witnesses lie, jailhouse snitches lie. Um, so a certain degree of perjury just happens. But I think when you have documents that are just false, you got a, that's a Rule 11 problem. And it's also an angry judge problem. It's just, it's just dangerous. The trick is catching them, though. Well, how in the world could you mention affidavit, but how in the world could one get a summary judgment without an affidavit? Well, in general, you can't. Um, That's what I thought. But in, in the case I had, there was an affidavit. It was hmm. just false. Like, you know, it, it complied with the rules about what an affidavit should look like and do. It just had false statements in it. Hmm. Yeah. And that, in, in a debt collection context, that's actually illegal under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. There is some decent case law under the FDCPA. And it basically, if you make a false statement in the course of collection litigation, that's against the law, if it's a debt collector. So, did I, did I answer your question? I, I kind of went Absolutely. off on a tangent there. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right, John. Wow. Well, this has been a, a ride through the law of fraud. Um, uh, as ever, my goal is always to get back to the idea of tackling injustice. And so from where you sit, Mr. Crump, um, how, well, if you had a chance to sort of remake things, to deal with some of the injustices that you have encountered, and I'm sure it's sounding like they are legion in your mm -hmm. line of work. Uh, but at least if you had a chance, you know, all right, I have the ability to step in and do these things that would really address this injustice. Well, what, what kind of things uh, would you recommend? Oh man, that's a big one. I can I can make a very long list. If I had to do a top three, I would say just repeal the Federal Arbitration Act because it is the shoehorn for all kinds of injustices. I would say that for any consumer or employment contract, you get one page front only. <laughs> and that's the deal. And if you can't fit all that crap on it that then it, it ain't important enough to fit because when i buy a car i can i can describe the deal on a post-it note right make model price monthly payment boom i could do that i think you get one page there's some, i think there's one or two states that have a one page rule for certain consumer contracts i think it's a great idea because it makes things simple and clear i think that uh the electronic transmission of contract documents. I think that should be a one page rule too. 
I think that a lot of stuff gets slipped in. You know, you make a Facebook account and you, you look at the terms and conditions. It's like 50 pages. I mean, how how can you really need 50 pages of stuff? You know, I, I think that it's needlessly complex to no consumer's benefit, because I guarantee you any website you're logged on to, any credit card, you can read through those 40 pages of whatever your contract is. None of it's to help you. None yeah. of it. You know, um, I would ban forum selection clauses so that if a forum selection clause des designates a certain state or judicial district as the only state that can hear disputes between two parties. So, you know, if um, if I order a, a hat from Etsy, you know, and I got I get it from someone in Minnesota, I shouldn't have to go to Minnesota if, with someone that's doing business here in Alabama, you know, if they give me the wrong hat or whatever. So I think that that is a, another needlessly complex expense. I think that if you're selling stuff to people in one state, then you got to be prepared to go to court in that state to enforce your rights or let them enforce theirs. Um, there are some, there is a thing called the FAIR Act, which Congress, the House passed, and it seeks to get rid of arbitration and consumer and employment law. It passed the House, hadn't passed the Senate yet. I guess whatever's happening there, I don't know. Maybe a, someone doesn't like it in the Senate. I don't know. But um, I would do those two things, and I would also have very clear minimum standards for product warranties. I think that you've seen an erosion of warranty rights over the past 50, 60 years. And the result is that most of the stuff we use and have is cheap imported garbage. And I think that anything you buy should have a full one-year warranty, at least. Otherwise, you shouldn't be selling it. If you can't stand behind your product for a year, you don't need to be selling stuff in the United States of America. All right. I did an interesting thing. I researched foreign warranty law in China. Actually, I, I found this from a corporate lawyer website that advises businesses who want to do business in China. They have very strict. They have very strict standards for uh, products sold on the Chinese mainland. And one of the interesting things is the full uh, chain of stream of commerce is liable. So if if I buy a vacuum cleaner that craps out on me after a week, um, the shop, I can sue the shop that sold it to me in China. This says I can sue the distributor. I can sue the importer, the whole chain. So that way you don't have some fly by night outfit disappearing, going to Costa Rica with all my money. You know, I think that'd be a good idea too. That would be excellent. So those are my so think, top three. So it sounds like at least part of what I hear you saying is trying to level the playing field. That Absolutely. Is what's happened is, yeah, the injustice comes because these large, well-financed, well-lawyered outfits mm -hmm. are now figuring out all kinds of way in the smallest type possible yes. to, to if not necessarily to take advantage of an individual to stack the deck so in favor of that larger entity mm -hmm. that, that the individual virtually has no recourse. That's basically it. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, it's a death by a thousand cuts. <clears throat> you know, It's the race to the bottom, another way to talk about it. And the only solution is to step in and legislate, you know, they, I always laugh when I see a credit card commercial and it says zero fraud liability, as if this credit card company is just so generous with their customers. That's mandated by the law. They passed the Fair Credit Billing Act like 40 years ago. They have to, they can't hold you liable for unauthorized transactions. You know, but, but that's a great example. The only time they, they give you something is when the government says they have to. There's a lot of other examples too, but I don't think we have time for them today. 
Well, then it all comes down to, it sounds like, um, legislation, because again, as you're saying, these issues with the Supreme Court are only changeable if Congress steps in and says, okay, no, 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 we hear what you're saying, but no, that's not what we meant, or that's certainly not what we mean now. Yes. Let's, let's re-examine this again with the idea that you know, if we want to be originalists, shall we say for a moment, you know, this Federal Arbitration Act was meant to provide a benefit to people in a certain situation. And now it's become this, you know, mutant alien thing yeah. that we never had any intention. It was never of. intended that way. And in fact, that's actually Clarence. I think Clarence Thomas is the only one that still thinks that. <laughs> He's like, this is a procedural federal courts. Arbitration shouldn't be in state state. It, you know, it, intrastate <clears throat> matters. Um, but yeah, it's going to require Congress because there's no help coming from the courts, not at the federal level, at least. Uh, in a lot of states, not at the state level either. It's going to have to come from Congress. And that's the only, you know, light at the end of the tunnel that, if there's going to be one. That's, that's a scary thought. Yeah. Judson yeah. Crump, how can people get in touch with you if they wanted to, if they had a consumer protection issue and they wanted to contact you? Call my office. What's the number? 251-272-9148. And do you have a website? Dr. Cheney mentioned the website. Yeah, it's it's my name, judsonecrump.com. www.judson, J-U-D-S-O-N-E-C-R-U-M-P? C-R-U-M-P. <laughs> Dot com. Thank you so much, Judson, for being on the show. Oh, thank you. Now, you're licensed in Texas and Alabama. That's correct. Do you follow college football? Absolutely. Is I went Alabama? to law school at Alabama. So, yeah, I'm, I guess you're more Alabama than Roll Texas. Roll Tide. Yeah, yeah, they, they won big <laughs> last night. Yeah, they play in Texas next week on my birthday. Yeah, and Texas, Texas, I think, has a good team, too. That's going to be an interesting game. Oh, uh, it's, it's not because Bama's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Have you back on just to talk about that game. If they lose. <laughs> thank you so oh, much man. for being on, Judson. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Dr. Good luck with your work and your mission. Yes. Thank you so much. You as well. All righty, you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank Bye-bye. You. Thanks for watching our video. For experienced legal services in Washington, D.C., Alabama, and Washington State, visit our website at remuslaw.com or call us at 1-833-329-1799.